Hello, good evening and welcome to this um, wonderful Taste of Palestine cook-along Christmas meal. I'm delighted to be joined by Phoebe Ryzen and her mum Nadia. Hi Phoebe, hi Nadia. Hi Chris, hi everyone. Hello, it's great to see you there. So you're based in Oxford, aren't you? Or just outside Oxford, is that right? Uh, we're, we're in Buckinghamshire, we're in Aylesbury. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm in Cambridge, so um, as about as close as to Jerusalem as we can possibly get at this moment in time. <laughs> um, but That's Nadia, yeah. your mum, Phoebe, your mum Nadia was from Jerusalem originally, is that right? Yeah, me and my mum are both born in Jerusalem, we're from there. Yep. And when did you both leave? So when did we both leave Jerusalem? I left Jerusalem in the 80s because our stay permits expired. That's like one of the very complex ways that Israel uh, removes Palestinians from Jerusalem. Um, Mum got a scholarship from the Lutheran World Church to go to study in Sweden. And she was there in 1967 when Israel occupied the West Bank. And because she wasn't there when they did the census, um, she just lost all her rights to kind of return. And, um, and that was it really. Chris just asked about when you left Jerusalem. It was in 1964. I did leave and I went to Sweden to study and then to return to my country. But unfortunately, there's a six day war in 1967. The Israeli, they occupied the West Bank and so I became homeless, more or less. I couldn't return as a resident to live in Palestine. I could now, with the Swedish citizenship, to live there as a tourist, I can go there. And they will give me m maybe three months to stay there, and then I have to leave. So I lost my own country in this way. <laughs> okay. um, thank you for that. Thanks, this evening is part of Greenbelt's Made in Palestine series. The Greenbelt Festival was Made in Palestine series. Uh, we'll say a little bit more about the other things they've got coming up in that. It's also part of Amos Trust Christmas program as well, and part of our Big Give campaign, which we'll talk more of as well. Uh, that's called Creating Hope in Palestine. Um, but we're going to start off, before we do the cooking, we should really find out what we're cooking tonight and how you can find the recipes if you're doing it. If you're not cooking along tonight, I'm not cooking along. I'm going to cook it next week. I'm really looking forward to spending a couple of hours and leisurely doing it because you may well not be able to keep up tonight. Find an hour is not long enough. Or if, like me, you like some tunes on when you're cooking and you want to do it another time, then I'll be doing it next week. But Phoebe, what are we cooking tonight, first of all? Okay, so tonight we're doing a real Christmas classic called Kubba. Kubba can be done many ways and we're doing it in Sunniya, which basically means we're, we're doing it in a dish or in a pan. Um, so this is a great Christmas Eve um, dish. You can sort of make most of it the day before. Um, everyone's really busy on Christmas Eve, going to mass, wrapping presents, seeing friends and family. Maybe not this year exactly, but um, it's a really great dish because it's, it's special, it looks fabulous and it's easy and quick to make on a, on a busy Christmas Eve. We're then having it with a beautiful jeweled fatouche. We're having it with a yogurt dip, which is really, really essential when you're eating kubba. And um, we're also going to make some awama, which is some deep fried dough dumplings in a rose syrup. Absolutely delicious and really traditional at Christmas time. So the, the dumplings, is that one you make earlier than just fry them off? Or can you fry them off early in advance or do you have to kind of eat them hot? <clears throat> eat them hot. You definitely want to eat them hot if you can, or at least warm. Yeah. Yep. I always get very scared of deep fat frying, so I'll, I'll let you do all that stuff anyway this time. Um, yeah, we'll talk you through it, actually. It's, it's easier than it, it seems. Okay. Now, um, I should let you start cooking, but just before that, I wonder, oh, as you start yeah. cooking, I wonder if you could just... Um, okay, have we got... Uh, I think we've yeah. lost um, one camera there. Phoebe, can you still hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. That's fine. Okay, We're still that's here. That's great. And we're just changing the angle there. That's great. Hello, both of you again. Um, Hello. And so, um, as you start cooking there, what are you going to be cooking first, Phoebe? Okay, well, we're actually, it, nothing is linear in, in Palestine. Time doesn't work the same as it works here in the UK. So we're actually going to, first thing we want to do is everyone should have their ovens on, should have put them on a few minutes ago to preheat to 190 to 200, depending on how hot your oven is. First, we're going to get our bread in the oven and then we're going to start working on the kubba meat, okay? 
So, if you guys are, are with me, I'll start chopping this bread up into small little squares. These are going to be our kind of croutons for the fatouche. Um, so there's lots of fat, fatouche fat uh, recipes and it basically refers to the chopped up, normally deep fried, but we're going to do it in the oven today, bread that you put on top. It's really, really delicious. Um, it turns it from a regular salad into something really, really very special. And what mum's going to do while I'm doing this is she's going to start frying off the meat, okay, which is going to be inside your kubba. So mum, do you want to start the meat? And we'll talk about vegetarian options in a few minutes' time. So your mum's going to start frying off the meat there. Yeah, so basically, if I can just say what's going to go into the pan just before we move on, Chris. So she's yep. just going to put all the spices that you can see on the recipe card. She's going to put the ground beef and she's going to put the onion. So she'll start with the onion and the olive oil. Um, Is that olive oil by any chance be this olive oil, Phoebe? Um, yes, absolutely. Be 18 olive oil. It'd be that yes, excellent it, olive oil, yeah. um, which yeah. is absolutely fantastic, isn't it? It is so good. It is really, really flavoursome. Um, it's got perfect acidity for the olive oil. It's really the best that you can get. Um, I'm a real olive oil snob, I have to be honest, because I've been to Palestine and been to the olive oil tastings, and I've been out with the farmers, and I know Phoebe has as well. And good olive oil like this is absolutely wonderful. It's such a treat. Do you even cook with this or do you kind of do what I do and cheat and you use the cheaper stuff when you cook? <laughs> yeah, you can do. I mean, really, good extra virgin olive oil to be enjoyed has to be had raw. But as you can see, I have also just put it onto my bread because with bread, it makes a real difference to the flavour, actually. Especially, so, you know, Palestinian olive oil, what makes it absolutely special is partly the topography of the ground, okay? So we've got a very, a very elevated climate. Um, our olives grow much higher up than in other countries. Um, and because of that, it's cooler, so we've got a very short picking season. So when things come into um, season and ripe enough to pick, to when they're, they're, it's going to become too cold and ruin the fruit, you've got a very small period. And that gives you the perfect acidity, um, wonderful flavour. The way it's also um, crushed in the community in Palestine is very important. So these um, fair trade and organic cooperatives that now exist there all over, especially the Northern West Bank, um, people just take their olive straight to the community press, it gets pressed, and the next day it's, um, it's perfect. And if you have it when it's just pressed, it's incredibly peppery. With a bit of bread, it's just one of the great delights. It's an absolute yeah, it's, thing. Yeah. it's bright green, it's very different to um, matured olive oil. And um, so I'll just put the bread in, coat it with olive oil, and I'll put it in for six minutes. So it's gone okay. for six minutes of bread, yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, the um, it, it's a, it's much more acidic. The fresh olive oil, it's bright green, and it's actually not everyone likes it. Some people find it too strong, and they need it to like rest for a year before they have it. So um, when you go to the market in Palestine, you can buy last year's olive oil or this year's olive oil. Um, so it's really good. Yes, the kubba can be frozen. Harriet O'Brien has asked if the kubba can be frozen. It can be. And actually, um, on um, our website, you can see that you can actually make kubba in small little bite-sized balls, which is also very traditional around Christmas time. Um, and me and my mum have made 172 of those two weeks ago, and they're all in our freezer waiting for Christmas time. So, oh, yes, and the answer is, You can yes. make vegetarian kubba as well, can't you? Yeah, so, um, so basically, we've got it listed in our, um, um, on our website, but you... Um, yeah, you can do a vegetarian one, and I'll talk you through the different vegetarian options. So first of all, instead of putting the meat on, um, you would actually do a medley of different vegetables, kind of your classic Mediterranean vegetables, including olives as well. Um, and then the next step is when we put meat into the dough stuffing, when we put meat into the dough stuffing, um, instead of putting the meat in, you'd put mashed potatoes in. That's how you would make these vegetarian. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do as well, we have to do this at the beginning of the cook-along, is I'm going to get the rose syrup going. This is what I said to you about Palestinian thyme not being linear the way UK thyme is. So I've got my two cups of sugar in the pan here. Um, and I've got one cup of water. I'm just going to add it in. And I've got the juice from one lemon. And I'm going to add that in also. And I'm going to put it on a medium, medium to low heat. So what's really important with the awama and all our Palestinian sweets 
is that, first of all, you drink everything in this rose or orange blossom syrup. Secondly, if one is hot, the other has to be cold. But so if you just repeat that, it's a little bit hard to hear. Sorry, what was that again? Yeah, if, 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 one of, if your cake is hot, then your syrup has to be cold. If your syrup is hot, then you have to put it on a cool cake. So those okay. are kind of the rules. Um, and so we need to get this syrup on now so that it's nice and cool for when we put our dough dumplings into it a bit later on. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna, yeah, go on Chris. No, that's absolutely fine. Uh, we're chatting about olive trees, and, and as always, we have an order for which we're expecting to talk about things and get completely lost in the first 30 seconds. So let's stay with olive trees for now. Um, olive farmers face an incredibly difficult time at the moment, don't they? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, um, um, it's worse than most years, I would say. Yeah. Um, on the screens, you'll see there's some information about a graphic which has been produced by Oxfam, which talks about it. But this year, the level of trees being burned by settlers, the level of attacks, the levels of harvesting being destroyed is really, really high. And also farmers are being restricted from going to their fields in large parts of areas sea. Anywhere near settlements, farms are not being allowed to go to their fields. Um, have you heard, you worked with a number of farmers on the ground there. Have you heard more recently, any further things about that, Peter? Yeah, I mean, one of the major issues actually is that a lot of programs that provide protective presence for farmers aren't working at the moment due to the COVID crisis. Um, so whereby some farmers are able to access their lands um, in October and November and they've been unable to because the international protective presence hasn't been there for them. Um, that's created um, huge, huge problems for people because um, in some cases they, there has just been harvest failures. Um, you mentioned an increase in settler attacks. A lot of people think that's because of boredom from lockdown that settlers have been under, um, that they're just going out and attacking um, more farmers. There's also um, administrative uprooting and destruction of olive trees, which is the army will decide that something is strategically important and having a certain view is important. And so they will, um, they will just cut the olive trees down to get a better view of a village or a better view of someone's house. Um, okay, we had a question there. We, we just had a question there. So I'll go over to my mum. So Stephanie Cooper has asked if both lots of meat go in now. Only one lot of meat. So this is only what Mama is doing now is just 500 grams of the roast of the beef. Okay, so you should be able to see that nice and big. So Mum's got softened onions. She's put the beef in. As the beef has um, cooked and browned, that's when you want to get your spices in, um, and it will turn to a beef a lovely rich brown colour. Um, and then once that's kind of nicely mixed in and the spices are looking really good. That's when we'll put in these um, pre-toasted pine nuts. Okay, so you only one lot of these. Um, and Fig, is this for the outside or for the inside? Of the this is the stuffing. This is for the inside. Thank you. This is what's effectively the pie filling. If you, my, my husband and my eldest son call this Palestinian pie. So, okay, um, so with your with your with your rose syrup, you just want to make sure that the, the sugar has all dissolved, and then keep it cooking for about two to three minutes after that has happened. So I've still got a bit of sugar in there, so it still wants to go on for a bit longer. Okay. Yeah, so farmers have had a really bad time at the moment, and now they're there. Oh, yeah, so now I'm adding the pine nuts, as you can see there. And this is what we call hashwa. So in Arabic, the word hashwa just means to stuff. Um, and so this is our this is our stuffing, essentially. And um, so as I said, we're making a Christmas kufta. Um, on our website, you can see that we sorry, we're making a kufta for New Year, um, which basically. So, it's a little bit hard to hear you because we're all frying. I want sorry, to get I'm next to the fryer, aren't I? Ah, oh, sorry. My bread is just going to come out of the oven now as well. So if you've, got a, if you've got a cooler oven, then maybe um, maybe keep it in for a bit longer. Mine's a hot oven, so I'm taking mine out now. Okay. So. Um, oh, cool. Can you show us what the bread looks like? Can we get a little closer? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll just give you a close up of the bread, and then we're going to look at what Mum's doing because it's a little technical thing there. 
So just lightly golden, not not too brown. So are they yeah. a bit they're a bit tender still? Are they when you bite no, them? No, they're no, they're crispy. They're completely yeah. crisp. Okay, great. Okay, so if we can get the Roman can camera over here, if that's possible. Um, so mum now, so 30 minutes before we started, um, we asked everyone to put their bulgar wheat in some water and we're now draining it, okay? So this is going to be your pie crust. And very simple to do, you just put it in a, a sieve, I guess we've got it in. Sieve all the water out and then you've got, got it dry there. Just your turn. Okay, my turn here. I think the, is bulgur wheat a traditional Palestinian dish? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of really unprocessed. It's just, it's um, it's often just referred to as cracked wheat. I don't mind um, Because it's just wheat that's been cracked down. But it's mature, so it's not like frika. Frika is a young green wheat, and this is a mature wheat. Okay, so we're now at the food processor, and we're going to make the crust for our... Um, I keep wanting to call it a Palestinian pie, um, which is fine. So, what we do here is we've got our bulgar wheat and we just want to put it in. And I don't know if people use bulgar wheat very much in the UK, but it's really nice. It's like a pilaf. You can fry onions, um, you can boil it in um, like a kind of tomato sauce and make it tomato -y. It's really delicious. You can add it to salads. It's really good. And a lot of people think um, the, the olive tree is obviously the, the symbol of Palestine. And it does make up a lot of people's livelihoods. But wheat production is actually the highest grossing um, and the highest land mass production in Palestine. Um, so wheat is incredibly important to the Palestinian diet. And actually, well, rice, is that growing throughout Palestine or just in certain parts? It, no, it's growing throughout. I mean, most, most, you see, because of the way area A, B, and C works, most. Um, fertile land production is in the north of the West Bank because that's the biggest block of area A. Um, so it, most of it will, will be um, in the northern West Bank. Okay, so our syrup is now turned off. It started bubbling, as you can see, um, and it's gone clear. So yours might have been um, misty or whatever to start with. It's now clear syrup, and I'm now just going to leave that there. Well, and when it's a bit cooler, when it's a bit cooler, I'm going to transfer it to a bowl so it can cool down properly. Baby, is the fan on by any chance above the oven? Yes, it is. Oh, that's what it is. Now we're just hearing the fan. Um, oh, that's far, that far better? better. Okay, yeah, so, for that. Um, so, so we missed everything about the... So you've taken the syrup off the flames. Yeah, we've taken the syrup off the flames. And as you can see, it's now completely clear. Okay. Um, so now, beforehand, it would have had a little um, white mistiness to it. And that's just got lemon and sugar in it at the moment. That's right. Uh, yeah, lemon sugar and water. Yeah. Okay, okay, now to, to the bulgur, I'm just going to add in onions. Um, the spices, which is um, mixed spice and paprika. I'm going to add in some salt. And now I'm going to add in my meat as well. Okay, and I'm kind of going to do and this so in Phoebe, if you're vegetarian, what would you put in as opposed to meat here? Yeah, so at this point, you don't even need a food processor um, if it's a vegetarian one. All you can do is you mash potatoes, you add the bulgur wheat into it, and you put in some finely chopped um, or crushed onions with the spices instead. So it's basically, you're basically substituting it with mashed potatoes. And you told me earlier that um, just before you press play, um, yeah. You said that corn isn't nearly as good as mashed potato for this corn mint. mint. Yeah, I wouldn't. Well, for, for this particular section, it wouldn't bind in the way that it needs to. The corn mint wouldn't because um, it's the fat content and it's the gloopiness of the, the mashed potatoes that allows that to happen. You could probably replace the hashware with corn mints. Um, so the middle doing... filling you could replace with corn mints, but not the outer shell. Yeah, I think so. Although if anyone is trying, if anyone tonight has just bought corn mints to do this bit, I'd be interested to know how it turns out. And to be honest, in the sunniya, it's a lot more forgiving. If you were making the small cupboard to fry, you'd have a bit of problems. 
Right, can I press go on this, Chris? Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Greenbelt's got coming up while you do that, if that's okay. So this is the first of the Greenbelt program for things coming up over the next few weeks. And the next item up, which I've got, is on Thursday the 10th at 8 p.m. So Martin, uh, Martin Joseph is doing a Palestine Rising with Raja Nahas, and I hope I've pronounced that properly. That's on Thursday the 10th at 8 p.m. Um, he's doing Palestine Rising with Raja Nahas. That will be streamed live. You can find full details of it and everything on that on the Greenbelt Made in Palestine site. You can see it coming up on your screens there. Um, Martin is uh, a real advocate for Palestine. He's been over to us a few times. He took part in a home rebuild in um, 90, about four or five, about six years ago with us in a refugee camp just south of Palestine, just south of Bethlehem, and has been involved in a number of things. So it should be a really good evening on Thursday the 10th at 8 p.m. Um, then a bit later on, on the 18th of December, there's a real treat, which is a Palestine podcast with Paul, Catherine and Rafif Siada. If you don't know Rafif Siada's poetry, uh, look her up. Um, she is the most phenomenal Palestine poet. We had her doing one of our days at Amos a few years ago and the whole about half the church was in tears. Her opening line was to say it was the first time she'd been in a church since she'd had to leave Lebanon during the attacks there when she was a child. And her poetry is incredibly powerful. We Choose Life, sir, was one of the poems which really she became most known for in the 2009 Gaza attacks. Um, and that one you'll see online and is really, really moving. We use it all the time. She's just got a new album just come out here, which is called um, Three Generations. Let me get it right. I have to do everything in reverse. Three Generations, which you can get as a download, you can get the CD. It's really, really strong. She was crowdfunding for it, and um, we're delighted to see it just come out. So she'll be talking about that in the podcast, 18th of December, full details there. She also appears in possibly the best publication to come out all year. You may think the best publication was something like a Paragon or any number of great books, but actually it's this. It's this book which we've just brought out. It's also got the best cover of the year. Isn't that just the most wonderful cover? We'll really kind of zoom in on there if we can do for one second. Um, it's more thoughts and reflections from Amos Trust, and it's got an unbelievable range of people in it. It's got Phoebe and it's got Paul from Greenbelt. It's got myself, and they're just, I mean, obviously they're the best people. But in addition to that, I'm going to read out a list of contributors as well here. We've got Brian Biltson, Jam Kurtzy, Rose Cook, Mahmoud Darwish, Imtius Darker, Caroline Duffy, Zena Kazimi, Audrey Lord, Jackie Kay, Michael Lernig, John McGregor, Dirk Mahan, Ahmed Masood, Roger Robinson, Lem Cisse, R.S. Thomas, Alice Walker, Martin Rowe, Rafif Siada. We've got so many incredible things. It's a rare, it's got not only poetry, prose, stories from our partners, stories from um, the hotel in Bethlehem, the Waldorf, stories from all around the world in there. It's got bits of liturgies, incredible quotes. There's one I was just looking at earlier on, which I'll just see if I can uh, see if I can just find again. Obviously, the piece of paper's just fallen out, so I may just be a second. Um, yeah, here it is. I'll read this quote. It's also got liturgy. We call them words of hope. So there's bits of liturgy in each chapter. There's eight chapters. And there's playlists with each chapter, all on Spotify. So you can go and play them on Spotify. So this is Seeds of Hope. And it basically is the things we've been posting on Instagram and Facebook ever since lockdown started. So we've done 250 of them now. And we've taken some of our favorites from this. And this is a quote I just wanted to talk about because it fits in today very powerfully. There's also quite a lot about Palestine in here. It's by James Baldwin. If one really wishes to know how justice is administered in a country, one does not question the policemen, the lawyers, the judges, or the protected members of the middle class. One goes to the unprotected, those precisely who need the law's protection most. And that's for us is so integral in Palestine. We, go to, we don't go to the people who give us the right message because they've got the power. We go to people on the ground, the local communities. And that's why hearing the voice of farmers, hearing the voice of other community people is really important because that's how you find out how justice is experienced. So that Seeds of Hope is from the Amos Trust website. It literally came out yesterday. So it's hot off the press. Um, you can pick it up there. We'll be delighted to send it off. 
um, details of it will come up on screen as to how you can get hold of that. So it's the Amos Trust website, and that's part of our range of Christmas products. Uh, we've also got uh, Christmas cards, which I've completely forgotten to have one with me here. I'll go and get one in a second. We've got um, face masks from Bethlehem. We've got a whole range of goods uh, on there. So please do have a look at that. Go there, get the stuff from Bethlehem. It will all be with you before Christmas. Now I'm going to pass back to Phoebe because she's finished with the food processor. Phoebe. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, that was really interesting. That book sounds absolutely great. And I'm sure that people are going to be rushing to get themselves a copy, Chris. Thank you for, for going through it's that. Great. It's great to have you in it. Um, it's a story which you told in the summer. It's the one you told in the summer about uh, your mother going back in the back to the bakery in the summer times and reliving that stories in it. So we're delighted to have that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. It's um, written by me, but it's my mum's story. It's a lovely one, that. It's a beautiful picture of life in Palestine back then, for sure. Um, so what we've done is we've just let this really work its way into a dough. You see there's a lot of it here. Um, and we've put some olive oil at the bottom of this bowl um, and we've, um, we're just putting this meat mixture in it. It's quite heavy, but we'll get it out. There we go. Right, and so what my mum's going to do is we treat it like a dough. So mum's now going to massage it in with a bit more olive oil. Do you want me to put some more in, Mama? Sure, yeah. Okay. So she's going to mix that in. Get that really nice and silky. Um, get it all looking great. And then we're going to start assembling our... Palestinian pie. Um, the reason we've rushed through this, I hope everyone's managing to keep up, is because we want to get this in the oven. So when you think about British dishes at Christmas time, and the cafe, you'll be pretty hard pressed to find something that you can do several dishes of in an, in an hour for your Christmas dinner. Um, and Palestinian um, Christmas is, is kind of similar, but um, this was one that we thought we could do as long as we got it in the oven really quickly. So I'm just putting a little bit more salt here. And you can see that that is, this is why I don't think corn mince will work very well in this section. Why you want to use the mashed potato um, if you're not using the, you can probably hear her mum's barking orders at me. So um, when I leave camera shot, it's because I'm retrieving something that I haven't already done. Okay. Um, Phoebe, have you got? A, can I ask your mum a question now? Or is she knee deep? Yeah, in sure. Pushing that out. Yeah, Phoebe, no, we'll find out. We'll ask her. Um, Phoebe, could you ask your mum about Christmases in Jerusalem when she was a child? Yeah, Mama, do you want to tell everyone um, at home about what Christmases were like in Jerusalem when you were a young girl? Okay. Yes. Christmas is very important. Uh, things in Palestine because it is more religious things. It is not a lot of food or present. When I was little it was more religious things where Jesus has been born and we have to go to Bethlehem to the grotto where actually we believe that Jesus was born there. And of course we have some kind of present but was more to sacrifice things. Uh, before Christmas and try to help those people that they haven't a lot. So in the boarding school we were taught to make like a shoe boxes, a present and so then this present they will go out and the funny things we always received another box of shoes <laughs> when we were there, yes. And of course it is a place at Christmas where family gathers together, we cook our own food and we are merrily, but mainly it is a religion thing that we think. Uh, and that it is remind, remind us of when Jesus was born and he was born in a major, in a grotto not in a palace, it's sort a of beautiful home. And so we hoped that for that, Christ has come to us. So he has put peace, and we hope peace it will be in Palestine. 
That is the main thing now that we think about Palestine and peace. Yeah, Merry I think Christmas to you. Thanks, Mama. I think you might remember from our session in the summer that Mum was um, in a the Franciscan boarding school, which is in the old city attached to the Latin Cathedral. So a lot of you might who are watching, if you've ever been to Palestine, might have actually been along that little narrow street and the, the archway that looks unsuspecting but you walk in and it's this huge courtyard and attached to that little, we used to call it the, um, the Terrace Cathedral because you have no idea when you're walking in it opens up into this giant, giant building. Um, right, so it's okay, interesting okay. actually because, um, go on Chris. So, um, so you've squashed this all flat in the dish now, is that right? Yeah, just about half of it um, is now flat in, as flat as I can get it in the yep. dish. Yep. Um, and now we're going to put the hashwa on it. I'll, I'll do it. And hashwa means filling, is that right? In Palestine? Yeah, in Arabic? It mean, yeah. yeah, it means stuffing really, yeah. Okay. I was just aware that I may not have heard it earlier on to the fans, so I thought I'd just repeat that. <laughs> Sorry. And in the stuffing is the mint, it's the onions, it's the um, spices, it's the pine nuts. Um, yeah, that's was it. That, and that was all the pine nuts went in there, didn't they? So the pine nuts, all We've those still got nuts. some raw ones. Everyone should still have some raw ones. Okay. Um, but yeah, all, all the ones that we ask people to pre-toast have just been chucked into the meat. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so with me, Christmas, um, the food is so integral, like Mum said, um, there wasn't a lot of commercialism back in the um, 40s and 50s in, in Jerusalem and in Palestine, and the holiday was just about going to church, eating and being with your family, and this is one of those dishes where it's just wonderful because you can decorate it, so I really like to zhush things, um, and this is the perfect zhushing dish. So, we've got all of that in. Um, what you'll also Let's get a good, if you... Can we just get a good close-up of that to have a good look at what it looks like? Wait, Mama. Brilliant. Just... Yep, that's looking great. Yep. I'm a vegetarian, so when I say it's looking great, it's completely insincere. But <laughs> I'm sure it's looking great for anybody who eats meat. <laughs> it's delicious. It's delicious. And honestly, you're, you're not. If you could smell it, Chris, we might actually turn you. Uh, I don't think so. It's been 35 years. I'm not sure I'm going to be turned that easily. Oh, you're not that old, are you, Chris? <laughs> I know you wouldn't have thought I was out of my forties. Um. <laughs> okay. Should I make it thinner? Okay, Mum's yeah. telling me to make it thinner. Yeah. So as people who have seen us at Greenbelt, I've mentioned this before, the way I treat you, Chris, I've learned from my, learned from my mum. Yeah. So, right, so we're going to get it as, I, I guess mum's saying she wants it quite thin. Um, the great thing about this is, you know, sometimes if you go into a pub, you might not know this, Chris, but you sometimes feel you've been shortchanged by all the delicious beef in the middle. The great thing about this is the crust has beef in it as well. So you're, you're going to be absolutely fine in terms of getting your fill. It's not all, you're never going to have just a mouthful of pastry. So this is going on top. And can I just ask, basically in Palestine, everybody's got their own kind of variations of a recipe, haven't they? So this is your mum's traditional recipe, isn't it? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, do you know what? It's, it is. I think if, if you spoke to different households in different regions, they'd make it in a different way, but everyone's got this dish. So kubbasaniya is like made by absolutely everyone, and you can do a fish one, you can do a veggie one. Um, <clears throat> but, um, but yeah, the exact ingredients or the way that you make it um, will be different in each household. One of the really different things is some households you go to, um, they, they'll do it in a round dish, and they'll do wonderful geometric patterns in it in the same way that you might have a pudding. If you've, you know, if you've been into those Palestinian sweet shops, you see these amazing puddings that have been cut into fabulous shapes. Um, yep. Right, so how's that looking, Mama? Yes. Right. Mum's happy with that. Fish won't get the best. The snobber? No, this. Yeah, yeah, I'll just put this on. Okay, so I'm just gonna wash my hands. And then we'll see where While you're we washing are. your hands, let me just say, I found the, the missing items. Um, nice with everybody in lockdown, we're showing offices. So these got moved um, during the day. These are the face masks. So it's a selection of three face masks. These are two of them. The third one's being used. 
from Palestine. So you can get these from the website, uh, made in Bethlehem, face masks. And all the money from these goes back, obviously, into Bethlehem to fund it. And then this is our Christmas card this year. So please do send this. Um, it's a design which we've been given by Peter Kennard and Cat Phillips. They've lent us its design. And the motive is, wish I could be home for Christmas. And it's got a wrecking ball in the shape of a Christmas um, ornament. And on the inside, it's got a very simple message. When we least expect it, hope bursts into life. Stable walls echo to a baby's first cry. So please do buy those things. All the proceeds from those goes to our Christmas appeal, which I'll say about a bit more in a second. So Phoebe, you're slicing this up now at the moment. Yeah, slice all the way down, um, all the way down. So what I've done, I, I asked mum if I, sh I should attempt triangles. She said, do squares. So um, I'm not the best at decorating. I enjoy it, but I'm not the best. For me, this is the equivalent of, you know, in the UK, you have those lovely decorated hams that you do at Christmas time. You get all the clothes and all the marmalade out. So this, for me, is the equivalent. Um, you score all the way down. Traditionally, you do diamonds or squares. Um, make it look as pretty as possible. So score all the way down through all three layers. And now this is where you want your, your raw almonds and your um, pine nuts. So you can either buy blanched almonds from the shops or you could get peeled um, almond with the peel on them. And um, oh, all you want to do is boil them in water and then they, the peel comes right off. Um, and I just happen to have some of those here, which you can get raw almonds from Zaytun as well. Yeah, um, and those are great. Um al they're the yeah. best ones to get. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in Palestine, they're so often at green, so um, literally in the spring. But these are the ones which managed to escape from all the people who go around eating all the green almonds and have come to fruition and are absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> Chris, you've got such a problem with us eating sour things in Palestine. It's always the first thing that you mention. Absolutely. Green almonds are delicious. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the problem with green almonds is if you do a home rebuild in the spring, you get the whole village giving you green almonds and each person because saying... Because they're special. They're yeah. delicious. And they say, have you tried these yet? And you're thinking, yes, I've tried so many of these and I can't stand them. So you have to take a mouthful and eat them again and again and again. And it's wonderful. Oh, hey, there we go. Yeah. So if you pick these up, just boil them <laughs> and put them in cold water, bring them to the boil, let them boil for a minute, take them off, let them cool down. And then um, the, the peel will come straight off, dry them off. You, they need to be dry and then you can just use them um, however you want, the way we've done here. Okay, so as you can see, I'm trying to make this look as beautiful as possible, um, and it normally does look absolutely fabulous by the time it comes out of the oven. Um, little flowers here. And you can do absolutely whatever you want. Um, it really doesn't matter, just make it look pretty. I'm just gonna put a few like that on each one. And those are the pine nuts you think, and those are non-roasted pine nuts, aren't they? Yeah, non-roasted pine nuts, which is actually quite nice because roasting a pine nut is like needing to take out a second mortgage if you burn them. Yeah. They're yep. such expensive little things. Um, but these just go on raw and they'll be nicely toasted by the time they come out of the oven. Okay, so now we're just going to put a little bit of olive oil over this. That's good. I forgot to get this out and I wasn't sure if I was going to find it because my youngest son likes walking around with it. I'm sorry, Mama. I'm a chiquitier. Oh, Mum's telling me to not put too much on. Okay, so just going to cover this all up. So this is our main course and as you can see, it didn't take too much effort. It didn't um, take too long. And now it's going to go into the oven. So you can make this the day before. And at this stage, just put it in the fridge. Just cover it and put it into the fridge. And then um, on Christmas Eve, you can get it out, pop it into the oven and um, enjoy it with your family. Um, could I just ask very quickly, with that, Phoebe, how many people would that normally feed? <laughs> it depends on the household, doesn't it? I mean, I think you can get away with, if you've got enough size, this can be a, a meal for six. Um, the the three adults and two kids in this house will probably eat over two days so it okay. really just depends yeah okay um 
yeah, this actually, it makes a great um, pack lunch yeah. the next day. It's up for 10 minutes. Yeah, so we're going to put that in for 30 minutes. <laughs> so I can get it in as soon as we hope to, I think, there. So, Phoebe, that's in for 30 minutes at what temperature? Uh, about 200, depending on if you've got a hot or a cold oven, between 190 and 200. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Now, we were just chatting. Uh, can you chat us while you, while you do this bit? Um, you're saying, yeah. I was wondering if, you're, if you still have many family in Jerusalem and on the West Bank, or have many of them left? Um, we still have family there, most of them have left, um, not by choice, a lot of them like my mum were studying abroad during the occupation um, and so they just weren't, they were just never allowed back in. Um, a whole generation actually of aunts and uncles lost their right to be Palestinian essentially then. After that? Yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm starting on the fatouche uh, and my mum's starting on the yoghurt dip and that yoghurt is absolutely essential with kubba. You can't have it any other way. Okay, so I'm just going to finally cut my romaine lettuce. Yeah, so we've, we've still got family there. Most of them are in the West Bank. Um, our, our family originates from um, Berzert and Tiber, which you'll know from the breweries and the university and things like that. Um, so that's where the majority of our family is. We've got a few people in Jerusalem and a couple in Gaza. Um, but yeah, mostly um, we're either in America, Europe, or the West Bank, the Iraqi family. Um, for your day job at Kairos Palestine, um, yeah. and we're delighted that they're very involved in promoting tonight and um, the rest of it. Um, one of your major things is about that disappearing Christian presence, isn't it, in the land? Yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, we are, we are just worried as an organisation and as a people that the Christian voice has been excluded so often from the peace process and been excluded so often from, <clears throat> you know, the known experience of Palestine and of Palestinians. Um, and we're essentially worried that there will eventually won't be any Christians in the Holy Land. Um, so we have um, our, our sister organisations in Palestine have um, written a document called Cry for Hope. Um, and in that document, they outline what they would require as solidarity from the global Christian community. And one of the things that we're really helping them with is um, getting that message out there. So we've been organising lots of seminars between Palestinian clergy and UK clergy so that we can get this message into the parishes, get this message into the hierarchy of the churches here in the UK. <coughs> and what we're essentially doing is we're looking for the churches to, to influence their institutions and also the government and the discourse in this country around economic pressures um, relating to the occupation. That's our main goal with what we're doing. Um, and obviously, Chris, you work um, with us on that, on the divestment campaign um, that we have with the churches. Um, we think it's one of the most important things we can do. Um, we get, um, we, at Amos, we believe in the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign very strongly. But we understand that some people and many churches find it very hard to talk about those things. What we talk about is positive investment. Um, and we talk about saying, actually, do we want the things that we invest in to be used for further occupation anywhere in the world? Not just in Palestine, but do we want it in Siberia or do we want it anywhere? So let's make sure that what we're investing does not go to those things which further occupation, companies who benefit from that. Let's really look into it. If, as we saw last week, we got loads of pictures sent through of bulldozers destroying uh, houses. Let's make sure that the companies, in that case, was JCB. Let's make sure, let's look into it a little bit and see what can be done to prevent that. Has the company been complicit? I'm not sure if they have been or not. In that case, people are looking into it. But there's many other cases where companies benefit from trading on the West Bank. And indeed, there's a lots of things happening at the moment whereby, and you may have seen Pence was in, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pence was in uh, the West Bank just last week or two weeks ago. And he was saying, we will now recognize settlements as part of Israel and sell all the goods from them. Well, under international law, it's illegal to sell those goods. So please be really aware of it. Look at divestment things because it's a really practical thing churches can do. But we should say it takes time. And like many campaigns, this is a long, drawn out campaign. And some denominations are moving really close um, to agreeing and signing things off. 
others are further away. And so find out more about it. Get in touch with Kairos Sabil. The details are on the bottom there. You can see the details there. Get in touch with them. They'd love to hear from you, and they'll put you in touch with the different groups who are campaigning in each of the churches there. Yeah, absolutely. We've got denominations in pretty much all the big churches here in the UK. And as you say, we've been having discussions with the church hierarchies and with policymakers within the churches, as well as clergy and congregations at the grassroots. Um, and some of the churches, I think, we're pretty close in the next few years to getting mor morally responsible investment policies put in place. And if that's something that you want to know more about or get involved with, then please just go to the website that's on the bottom of your screens now. Um, you also mentioned, as you're saying that, about um, the minister's training. I know there's resources, so Bill Carroll has got resources for churches to use over the Christmas period. Um, we've also got resources on the AMOS site, which you can use, download. Um, we've got bits of liturgies, we've got prayers, we've got some readings and poems. I know there's a whole load of resources on there from Kairos USA. Is that right, Phoebe? Yeah, so if you go to our website, if you look up Preach Palestine, you'll see lots of fabulous um, resources there that support people, um, clergy, um, to, you know, how do you talk about Palestine? Um, how do you talk about the issues there to your congregations? Um, how do you spread awareness about the injustices that are happening there? to Christians, you know, having real lived experiences there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we would say, how can you not talk about it when you're talking about Bethlehem this Christmas? How can you not actually talk about the situation in the ground there as well? Yeah. If you're nervous about that, please get in touch with people. We're really happy to talk through about how you do it. If you're nervous speaking about it in the church and giving practical tips to how to start so that you don't get loads of people walking out. The first time I went to Palestine, I came back in this 2003, it was really raw because it was the end of the second intifada. And I, they asked me on the morning back um, to say something in church. So I stood up, I was meant to do five minutes, I did about half an hour. A couple of people walked out, <laughs> outraged by it. And I realized that actually I was just too full of it to speak about it then. And so we do a lot of things with people saying, actually, this is how you do it. You don't want to have that impression. You don't want to have that effect on people. You want people to listen um, and not just to be so full of things. So we do a lot of stuff with people about how you can talk about it, how you can get the facts across in a helpful way and to engage with people as opposed to being divisive. Um, Phoebe, anything else you'd like to say about Kairos Palestine at the moment? No, just that we're doing absolutely amazing work. Um, we'd love you to join our divestment or our morally responsible investment campaign. Um, we'd love for you to join our clergy seminars, no matter what denomination you're from. We've still got some um, availability in our January and February seminars. Um, yeah, absolutely. Just get in touch with us. Um, we do lots of, um, you know, interesting things. And uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Um, Phoebe, I've just realised that I didn't actually ask you what you've been doing in the salad at all. So I know. I'm, I'm, so I'm desperate to tell you. <laughs> OK, so what I've done is I've chopped up all the lettuce, one tomato, most of the radishes and most of the um, red pepper, uh, green pepper. Um, I've um, got a few sprigs of mint and I've dressed it all with some mat, um, with olive oil and with um, uh, lemon, yeah. So that's all being dressed and tossed. Okay, can and I just the reason I'm dressing it, yeah. yeah. Um, so how big did you chop everything up? Um, about this big, Chris. <laughs> uh, so yep. um, it's, I don't know, the lettuce is kind of shredded. Um, everything else is kind of diced, I suppose, apart from these which are in little discs, just because they look so beautiful. So the reason I've dressed that bit of the salad is because um, I like it to look as pretty as possible, especially when it's sat next to our beautiful kubba sunia. So this bit that's going to go on top is going to be lightly dressed without being tossed. Okay. Um, so and we put sumac on there, is that right, baby? Yeah, yeah. So the dressing is sumac, salt, olive oil, and um, lemon. Yeah. Okay. So so this is where I kind of layer the salad. I think this is how it looks best. This is why I call it my jeweled salad. And again, things are in a kind of large dice, I suppose you'd call them. Um, reasonably sized cubes. Okay, so that like that. Then I'm gonna put a bit of this nice green on. 
similar size. Okay, now I'm going to start layering on this bread. This provides a really delicious crunch. I normally serve some on the side, so whatever's left in the pan, after you think the salad looks good, I just leave the rest for the pan. I'm sorry, for a little side dish and people can add more croutons as they go. some of this lovely colour on and now the best bit is about to come which is our delicious delicious and very colourful pomegranates okay so again what I normally do is I sprinkle loads of this on and then I put the rest in a little side dish with a spoon and people can add more onto their individual salads Okay, so and just because those top little bits haven't been dressed, just a tiny bit of olive oil. I'm gonna put that mint in there because that's how my mama would do it. Then sprinkle on some salt. Okay, so your two sides are now completely finished. And now, Phoebe, I'm not sure we talked about what went into the yogurt at all. Okay, so the yogurt is peeled cucumber chopped up mint and crushed garlic and a, and a bit of salt. <clears throat> and um, so that's just, was it one garlic, five in there, some of that? No, there's four or five. Four or five, so it's got a bit of a kick yeah. to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's sharp, you can taste the garlic. Okay, so garlic, chopped up mint, peeled cucumber, all that diced, mixed into that. And was that Greek yogurt or what sort of yogurt is it? Yeah, I mean, you can use a Greek yogurt or you can use um, like a, a natural yogurt. Um, I've used a Greek one today just so it's a little bit thicker. Yep. Okay, so Chris, we're now on to the vital part, the bit that I've been terrified of the whole time, which is our pudding sauce, okay? So our two sides are finished. We're waiting for the cover to come out of the oven and I'm just starting to heat up the oil, okay? So, Chris, if you can just say something to our lovely audience yeah, for a moment. I'd be very happy I'm going to, to come over and check on my dough. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've got coming up at Amos Trust at the moment and what's going on here. Um, so, we've been this year, we've got our Create Hope in Palestine, well, Create Hope for Young People and Children in Palestine campaign, and specifically in Gaza. And we applied to a thing called the Big Give. Now, the Big Give uh, matches donations which are given. And we applied in the summer and we weren't sure they were going to do it for Gaza or not. Um, but they agreed to do it for Gaza and because lots of places won't support projects in Gaza because of the political situation there. But they agreed to it in Gaza and we work with two incredible Christian organisations there. Um, one of them called NECC and the other one called the Al Ali Hospital, which have been set up for years. And they've got very firm governance and firm arrangements there. And so um, they agree that they would match any donations we receive between the 1st and 8th of December. So we set a figure of £20,000 that we would ask our supporters to raise £20,000 between the 1st and 8th of December. And then £20,000 be matching. So in total, £40,000 would go to uh, our project in this NECC in Gaza. We launched this at 12 o'clock on Tuesday. By 6.30 that evening, we had raised the full £20,000. So a huge thank you to everybody who's given so remarkably. We decided that as opposed to stopping it then, we'd keep this going and we would try to find further matching. And so far we've had another £20,000 given and we think we've, we, well, we, we have pretty much secured another £20,000 of matching. So that means something in the region of £80,000 is going to be going to Gaza this Christmas. And we're saying until the 8th, 12 o'clock on the 8th of December, any money you give through our Big Give campaign, we will make sure is doubled. And we're going to lots of different people to make sure it's going to be doubled. So we will make sure that anything you give, because the situation in Gaza is awful at the moment. Before COVID hit, 49% of the population was unemployed. 49%. And youth unemployment is running at something between 60 and 70%. This is before COVID. 80% of families 
are dependent entirely on uh, food aid. You've got power cuts for at least 12 hours every day. You've got sewage plants not working properly. You've got the massive restrictions whereby people can't leave Gaza. Obviously, there's no unless you've got some medical condition or something like that. And even then, it can be incredibly hard to get a permit. Added to that, there's regular flashpoints in conflict. There's bombing raids. There's some rockets occasionally fired over from Gaza as well. And there's also attacks on fishermen. So the situation is just incredibly difficult. For a long time, COVID didn't get into Gaza, but then in August, they had their first cases. And the last two weeks, the number of people has tripled with COVID in Gaza. And basically, we spoke to our partners at NECC today, who our appeal is from, and they said, the real figures are far, far higher than anything you'll see reported because they've got so few tests that something like one in two tests are coming back positive. So the figure which we get, and the figure, I've got it down here somewhere, I'll just see if I can get the actual right figure. So the figure at the moment was 12,000 new cases in the last three weeks. That means that there was 24,000 tests done. Not that there's 12,000 new cases, because basically about one half of them are coming back. So the actual number of cases is vast. Most people can't stop work because if they don't eat, don't work at all, they won't eat. And so you've got this thing where people are keeping it quiet, they've got it. The number of fatalities is increasing. So it's a really difficult situation. There's 100 ventilators in Gaza. That's the most. There were 60 odd and then 28 more got given by the WHO. So there's real needs there. There's real needs for PPE and a whole variety of services. NECC are doing hotline services for people. They do clinics for families and they're doing hotline services, doing loads of advice and guidance. But as you can imagine, it's just a desperately difficult situation and it's so densely overcrowded. So our Christmas appeal this year is to help alleviate some of that, to respond to that situation, but it's also so longer term they can create hope for young people and children. You can see full details there. Please give what you can do. And we guarantee that anything given before the 8th of December, we will look to get match funded. So it will become worth twice that amount. How are we going to do it? We're not entirely sure. We've been asking lots of people, but we have absolutely no doubts we're going to get there. So please give what you can do. So every pound will be worth two pounds and make a huge, huge difference. You can see all the details on your screen there. So that's our Christmas appeal. Phoebe, are you ready to talk again or shall I carry on chatting for a bit longer? Yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, so our oil is just heating up. Now, about an hour ago, you would have all made this dumpling batter mixture. So you'll see now... Um, hopefully yours looks a bit like ours and it's really really bubbly okay so that's because um we want it to be very light um, and very delicious when it hits the pan okay um, phoebe if you if like so, me you didn't make it an hour ago how did you make that up what was it went into it okay so it's just one cup of flour um a quarter of a cup of corn flour less than a cup of water warmish water a sachet of yeast a teaspoon of salt and a teaspoon of sugar. That's and that's just plain flour, is it? Yeah, just normal plain flour. So, so at the moment, this is a, and you want it, it's not gonna be like a dough, like um, like a bread dough. It's going to be like a cake batter. That's how loose you want it to be. Okay. Okay. So as you can see, it was quite a small amount when I put it in. Um, you've then let it rest for a while and it's now got this lovely bubbly consistency. And so these are just going to drop into the oil. And if I can just carry you through the workstation, so the rose. So just has it doubled in size? Would you say? Yeah, it, it has definitely doubled in size. Okay, so what you want to do now is add a tiny smidge of your rose syrup into your um, sugar syrup there. Okay, so that's all you need. And in in Palestinian cooking, I often find that talking through the workstation is really helpful to the success. So you've got your batter here. You've got your hot oil there. You've got your sugar syrup there. So when you take things out of the oil, it's going to go straight into your sugar syrup. When it's coated, you're going to take it out and you're going to put it on a lined um, bowl. Now, how are you going to get your batter into the hot oil? You just want a teaspoon. I tend to use this. I think it works quite well. And you want it covered in oil. And the reason you want it covered in oil is because you want the batter to come off quite easily and quite quickly um, into the oil, um, just because you want them to be round. <laughs> So it's a vanity thing. Mine are never as round as my, my grandmother's used to be, uh, my mum's mum, but that's okay. <laughs> so if you guys are ready, 
we'll see if this is going to work for me. Okay. So, you just want a little I bit of... I feel this should be a drum roll or something. No, I know. I feel like that too. I'm incredibly nervous. Let's see how the oil's doing. Okay. The oil's probably not quite hot enough, but it'll get hot enough as we go through. So, it's a bit like making pancakes. Your first one isn't going to be perfect. Okay. And every few, you want to just pop them back into the, you want to pop it back into the oil, okay? That you've got in your little side dish. Okay. So you want to turn these, make sure they're looking okay. And like I say, this, you, you don't need to have these looking perfect. Um, some people are very good at getting them perfectly round. Normally when I do a batch, um, about 40% of mine are nice and round, and the rest are at the bottom, and they're still delicious. Okay, so what you want, you just want to wait for them to be a quite nice golden colour, um, and when they are, you're just going to pop them out and put them into your rose syrup waiting on the side there. Okay. So. Just a little bit longer. And so these, you sometimes find them um, in Nablus, which is famous for its um, dessert shops, its sweet shops, as we call them. Um, you can get these, especially around um, Advent and um, Christmas time. So I leave them. Mom's telling me to leave them alone in the pan now. Right, okay, so while I'm you're leaving those alone, I'm just going to push two other goods, which I hugely recommend by Zotun, which are caramelized almonds they do a chili almond they do caramelized almonds caramelized almonds these are so edible you'll just kind of sit there munching your way through them as you watch your favorite film at christmas or any series you want and then medjool dates medjool dates are the best dates and the palestinian date farmers are under so much pressure on the jordan valley it's incredibly difficult the dates are a remarkable thing it will grow with virtually no water and the worst water but the pressure which the date farmers are under is huge these dates are absolutely gorgeous. I couldn't recommend them enough. Um, obviously, it's a key part of Ramadan normally, but for us at Christmas, these are the dates to have, and they are a great present as well. Phoebe, back to you. Yeah, actually, if I could just say a little something about the date farmers in the yeah, Jordan Valley. Do. So, as anyone who's been to the Jordan Valley, you'll know that I think when people think about um, think about the settlements, they just think about the red roof, swimming pool, house type things. But actually, the most corrosive settlements and the ones that are a real, real problem for the Palestinian people are actually the agricultural settlements that are down in the Jordan Valley. Um, what, what they do is absolutely awful in terms of um, a theft of um, land, an incredibly rich soil, very fertile land. Um, they make the, the farming community's lives hell around there. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult um, for a Palestinian if you're living there with that encroachment upon your space. Um, so yeah, buying from Palestinian farmers who are in the Jordan Valley is hugely, hugely important. Um, it's a very, very significant thing to do, especially around Christmas time. And like you say, those medjool dates are an absolutely perfect stocking stuffer. So yep. um, yeah, you really, want to, um, you really want to support them. So I'm just still um, adding um, some my dumplings to the um, to the water. As you can see, some of my dumplings have what my mum calls a tail on them. Um, some of them don't. They're all different sizes. So please don't worry what yours come out looking like. That's a nice one. That's a good looking one as well. Okay, so they're going straight into my date syrup. And, um, sorry, my date syrup. They're going straight into my rose water syrup. Um, and so what the, the recipe that I've given for you today is a rose syrup. Um, and I'm going to decorate them with rose and some chopped pistachio nuts. They're very nice. Another nice alternative is if you, you can use rose water in your sugar syrup and, um, and then dust them with some cinnamon. And that's, that's very, very nice also. Um, so Phoebe, do a few I think, more of these. Um, and then Phoebe, I, I think, think you're going to have to... Could we move on? Could you, could you decorate those ones up and then cook a few more later on maybe after we come off air? Yeah. Is that cool? Yeah, I was just going to suggest that I'm not going to do too many more of these, um, and I'll let people do them on their own in their kitchens. So I'm just going to put three more in, Chris, and then you're right, we'll okay. move on. Well, as you're doing that, let me just say about um, the event which we've coming up next Monday. So as part of our Big Give, we've got the Big, we've got the big Give Christmas event, which is on Monday at 7 o'clock. 
We really do recommend you come along. We've got Sammy Arwad from Highland Trust, who many of you will have seen at the Greenbelt Festival um, and who hosted a session this morning. He's hosting it with us um, and he'll be giving an update about the situation in Bethlehem and the situation in Gaza. In Bethlehem, they're entering into partial lockdowns at the moment and they think they may have a full lockdown by Christmas, is what's being talked about. He'll talk more about that on, on Monday. He'll talk about some of the home demolition stuff which is going on as well. And he'll say a little bit more about Gaza. We've got Sammy joining us from that. We've also got some incredible poets. Harry Baker's recorded a couple of new things for us. So we're showing one of those there, a new film and a new poem on Monday night. Zina Kazimi's doing some stuff live for us as well. Then we've taken the best of our webinar series. And we've got extracts from that. So Rafif, um, so we've got um, Raja Shahadi reading to us. We've got people from al recording a poem. Abdul Fattah doing a poem from there. So we've got a whole load of stuff. We've got great music. In a few minutes' time, we're going to play a song to you, which I'll say about then. That's going to be from Beth Rowley, which we're going to have shown. We've got Rafi Siada doing some music. We've got Martin Joseph's just recorded a song for us as a kind of warm-up for the Greenbelt gig. Um, and various other, and Garth and other people as well. So we've got a whole load. That's Garth here, so who was the founder of Amos, uh, which is why I describe him that way. Um, so Garth's going to be doing something as well. So we've got a whole load of stuff in there. So please come along, 7 o'clock on Monday. It should be absolutely fantastic. And we've got two new films from Gaza. We've got a film about COVID in Gaza, which is made by people from Gaza. And it's a really powerful and moving film. And we've got this new film from Gaza, which we're going to show in a few minutes, which is part of our appeal. But I'll say more about that in a second. Bibi, so you're laying these out now, is that right? Yep, just making a little pile of them. Obviously, if you, if you do the whole batter, you'll have a lovely, gorgeous pile. In here I've got my um, rose petals and I've got my um, pistachio and it's just a case of doing that. These are lovely at a little party or if you've got some friends over, really good with champagne. Right, so these are all done. This is how I would serve them up. And now the last thing to do is our um, kubbasanilla is now ready. So I'll be able to take that out of the oven for you. So, this is it right here, and it looks very, very good. Head done out? Yep, I think it's ready. Okay, so, there it is. That does look kind of fantastic. I'm going to let you just sort of feast your eyes on that. So these are ready-made, gorgeous, little, delicious portions, each one. You have to absolutely make sure you have it with plenty of yogurt, side of salad, and then finish it off with your delicious rose and sugar-soaked dumplings. And um, so you've got some pickles as well, have you, Phoebe? Is that right? Yes, I do. In fact, so on the, what we always serve this with, I'll just bring them over so you can have a look. In fact, I don't know, should we move things onto our Christmas table? We've actually set um, our table for Christmas, Chris. If we just turn the camera around, Christopher, can you? And we won't be able to hear you, I don't think, Phoebe, if you walk over there. So can we just, yeah. Okay. So can you still hear us, Chris? Yep, we can just hear you. Speak loudly. Okay. Yeah. So this is what we would be sitting down to on Christmas Eve. Um, and this is the table that we set. And so as you can see here, we've got bright pink pickled turnips, some nice um, tart olives, and some pickled cucumbers. And this is what we eat this dish with. And we also serve it with some fresh lemons. And so that's your Christmas Eve meal. And then after that, is it presents or is that the next day? No, that's the next day for us. Yeah, that's the next day. Yeah, <laughs> Just after class on Christmas Day, yeah. Yep. Um, that looks absolutely fantastic, Phoebe. Um, can I say, a he I'm really jealous of everybody who's going to eat that now, apart from obviously the meat. But it looks fantastic. I'm so looking forward to cooking it next week. Um, I thought, I wonder if your mum wanted to say a final word at all? Mama, do you want to say a final word to the people at home? No. I want to say something to the people at home watching. Yes, we hope that this Christmas it will be a, a disease-free Christmas. And all the family, they can get us. We know that it is difficult time with the COVID-19, not only here in England, it is global in the whole world. And we hope that this will go out 
but we still we can enjoy the coming of Jesus Christ and we are together. Though this year might not be very much family gathering together, but at least they allow us to be something. Yeah, and just to say thank you for everyone who tunes in. I hope you <coughs> enjoy the food if you have it tonight. I hope that you enjoy it if you cook it in the future. I hope you have fun with it in the kitchen. Um, and I hope you all have a really wonderful Christmas. Thank you so much. Um, Phoebe and Nadia, it's been wonderful. We really hope in August we'll be cooking together. Um, you may have another child. Well, you should have another child by then. If you haven't, yeah. it's just kind of... Yeah, and we hope that goes well. It wasn't, just, it wasn't just a visual aid for Christmas. Um, there's another one in the way. Um, so we really hope that goes incredibly well. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Chris. Yeah, so my, my baby will be here in a few months' time, my third one. Yeah, so um, thank you for that. So let me just finish by saying a little bit more about the events we've got coming up. So as I mentioned, on Monday, we've got the events which uh, we're hosting, 7 o'clock on Monday. Go to our website, find out about that, the Bethlehem, big Bethlehem event. It'll be absolutely fantastic. Um, then on Thursday, there's uh, Palestine Rising and Martin Joseph and Raja's Nahas. Then on the 18th, there's uh, the Palestine podcast with Rafif Siadi. You can find out about those on the Greenbelt website. We're going to leave you with this film which we've had made for our Palestine. Oh, so I should also say around all that for the next few days, there's a Bethlehem Festival, which you can just look up www.bethlehemfestival.org. I think it is. I'll get this the address to come up on the screen there. Um, so um, if you look up this cultural festival, the people at al have put this on. It's an incredible program over the weekend. So have a look at that. So there's so much stuff coming up. Visit our website, visit the Facebook pages, visit um, Instagram, see about that. Buy your books, buy your Zaytun stuff, buy your Christmas goods. But please gift the Christmas appeal. We're going to leave you with this film now. This film was made, Beth Rowley has sung a cover version of Massive Attack's Protection. And Massive Attack and Tracy Thorne, who sung this, have both given us permission to use this. It just came through in the last 24 hours. And we're incredibly grateful to them and the publishing companies for giving us permission to use this. So this is Beth Rowley singing protection over footage from Gaza. And it's for our Creating Hope campaign for Christmas for Gaza. So please give what you can. Until the 8th of this month, 8th of December, everything will be doubled. Um, so we're going to leave you now with protection sung by Beth Rowley. Thank you so much, Phoebe. Thank you, Nadia. And thank you, Greenbelt, for hosting this evening. This girl I know needs some shelter She don't believe anyone can help her She's doing so much harm, doing so much damage But you don't want to get involved You tell her she can manage you can't change the way she feels But you could put your arms around her No, you want to live yourself But could you forgive yourself If you left her Just the way you found her I stand in front of you I take the force or the blow protection. I stand in front of you. I take the force of the blow protection. She's a girl, you're a boy. Sometimes you look so small You've got a baby of your own When your baby's grown She'll be the one to catch you when you fall I stand in front of you I'll take the force of the blow 
Sometimes you look so small, need some shelter. Just running round and round, hell to skelter. And I've leaned on you for years. Now you can lean on me. That's more than love. That's the way that it should be. I can change the way you think, but I could put my arms around you. That's just part of the deal. That's the way I feel. Then I put my arms around you. I stand in front of you. I take the force of the blow. Protection. I stand in front of you. I take the force of the blow. Protection.